Anyone here tonight happen to have change for a three dollar bill? Nobody has change for a three dollar bill? You see, tonight we are going to look at the real versus the counterfeit. There are no counterfeit three dollar bills because there are no real ones. The devil will only counterfeit that which is a reality in the realm of the spiritual. And so he has got many counterfeits out there. We've looked at several of the counterfeits. We've seen that he has a counterfeit day of worship. We've seen that he has a, a counterfeit um, savior even. He has a counterfeit of what happens to people when they die, a counterfeit of the second coming of Jesus. Every reality of Scripture has a counterfeit of some sort attached to it. And the counterfeit that we're going to look at tonight has to do with the gift of prophecy. Today you can go almost anywhere and you'll see these signs hanging outside of Houses even, not just uh, storefronts, but even houses uh, that people will read your palms, they'll read your tea leaves, they'll read whatever you want to. And um, you can probably bring your own something to them that they'll read for you as long as it doesn't have words on it. So the psychic phenomena today is amazing. There's a, there's a tremendous explosion of that today. You can even call the psychic hotline. That's always advertised on the, on the televisions. And uh, there are over 3,000 astrology columns in North American newspapers. I even know people that won't even get out of bed if their horoscope tells them it's going to be a bad day for them. That's how much some people are into this stuff. Um, it's, it's like playing a, a roulette game of gambling. Is it right? Is it wrong? How do we know what the future holds? How do we know if a person truly has the ability to see things in the future or to give counsel to people in the present. Out of the 250 specific published predictions in, in a paper here not long ago, some years back, they found less than 3%. That was to say only six out of the 250 that could possibly be reasonably listed as reasonably fulfilled. And 97 percent, or 244 of the 250, had missed the mark completely. You ever been in a grocery store and you see the 10 top predictions by the 10 top psychics? I can remember years ago, Gene Dixon was always at the top of the list. What makes one one of the top 10? Well, it has to do with how many of their predictions come true. Gene Dixon, by the way, also, those of you that are old enough to remember, when Kennedy died, she made a statement that she saw President John Kennedy doing an Irish jig on his tombstone. Immediately when you see these things, you know that they are not of God. So the question is, should we consult psychics today? Should we look for these things? The Bible gives us an answer to that. Remember, we've seen every night that the Bible has answers for everything that we face in this world. And in the book of Isaiah, the eighth chapter, notice what God says. When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Now, how many of us have seen these programs and things where that's exactly what they do? These psychics come out and they tell you about all of the things that your dead loved one is doing, what they're going through. But God says we should not be consulting with these mediums and wizards. 
He goes on in the next verse and he says very clearly, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, they are in darkness. If what they say is in any way contradictory to what the Word of God says, then we know that they are presenting the works of darkness rather than of light. Jesus gave a warning all the way back in the book of Matthew. In the 24th chapter of Matthew, look what our Savior said. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive who? Many. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In the seventh chapter of that same book, he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. You see, if there were not going to be true prophets, Jesus would not have qualified this statement. He would have just simply said, beware of prophets. But the fact that he said, beware of the false ones is a clear indication that there were going to be true ones. And he says, by your fruits, you will know them. So how are we to relate to a person who claims to be a prophet. What if somebody came up to you, and I've had this happen to me on many occasions over the years, and they tell you that they are a prophet and that they are God's messenger. Do you slam the door in their face? Beware that you don't do that until you know whether the prophet is true or false. You see, you must find out if that person is a true prophet. And the way to find out is to weigh what they say to the Word of God. And when you do that, then you will know whether they are a prophet of God or not, because they are always unequivocally in harmony with what the Bible teaches. So this is what God warned us through the Apostle Paul, and we'll look at this a little later on. He says, do not quench the spirit. That word quench means to extinguish or to put out the Holy Spirit. Why would you do that? By despising what? So we should not despise prophecies, but rather we are to test all things and hold fast that which is good. So how do we relate to a person who claims to be a prophet? Well, first of all, we don't despise prophesying. We know that it is something that is found in the Bible, so we don't despise them, but we instead we prove everything they say by comparing it with Scripture. Back in Deuteronomy at the time of Moses, God um, gave a warning there for his people. Watch what he said in Deuteronomy 13. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. Did you see this? He's given a sign. There's a, he's performed a wondrous thing, but after he does that, he says, Let's go after other gods. Let's serve these other gods. God says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or of that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So if a prophet directs you some way other than what the Word of God says, if a professed prophet, and almost all of them, but not all, most of them that I have met will always tell you you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Don't have to keep the commandments of God. 
immediately you know that he's a false prophet. A true prophet leads you in the will of God. He, will, he or she will lead you in what the word of God teaches. So how do we relate to them? Well, the third point is that we come to understand that signs and miracles are not enough proof. You must compare it to the word of God. John said in 1 John, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So what does he say we are to do here? Test. We are to test these spirits to make sure that it's from God and not one of these false prophets. So the third or the fourth point that we must do is to test the prophet. So any time that a person who professes to have a message from God, but he doesn't want you to test him, you know that he's already failed the test. And so how can we tell the true prophet from the false prophet? We know that both exist and have and will till the end of day. How do we tell one from the other? Remember Matthew 7, Jesus said, by their what? By their fruits you shall know them. So the things that they produce, that's how you will tell the true from the false. So there are several Bible tests to find out if one is really from God or whether Satan has sent them to lead people astray. The first of these, a true prophet is always accurate. They don't work on a percentage basis. They're not trying to get into the top 10 of anything. When God says something through a messenger of his, it will always happen. And you'll see this in Jeremiah 28, 9. A lot of these will be in the book I'm going to give you tonight. The second point, that no prophet will try to make the word of God of any private interpretation. You know, there's a particular church, I won't tell you the name of it, but they are located in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> and they claim that nobody can understand the Bible except as their founder and their reigning prophet tell them what it says. A prophet will never, ever put what they're saying above the word of God. The third test of a true prophet is that they will speak whatever God commands, even if it's not pleasing. You know, a lot of these guys spoke these things and it cost them their lives, but they were still faithful in presenting what the word of God says. When a prophet speaks, the, the, the fourth test is that that prophet never speaks in their own name, but they speak in the name of God. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith God, this type of thing. They are speaking, they have become a mouthpiece for the great God of heaven. Also with that prophet, everything in their lives must be in harmony with the Bible. Okay. If their life is not in harmony with what Scripture says, why would we ever want to believe that God would take somebody that's in rebellion to what Scripture reveals and say, oh, God will use that person to bring us a message? So beware of that. Those five points keep in mind because they're very, very vital. We must come to understand the purpose of a prophet. Why does God give the gift of prophecy? Amos told us this all the way back in Amos chapter 3. He said, surely the Lord God does nothing unless what? He reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. He does what? Yeah, but he does nothing but that. You see, if God's going to do something, he will reveal it through the prophet. Okay? So that's one of the purposes, is to show the people what God is doing, or is about to do, and even has done. But um, when a prophet is called on the scene, 
It's not to make a lot of money. It's not to make a lot of friends. Notice the role of the prophetic office. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So the first one is edification. That means to build them up and to strengthen them, to exhort them, is to counsel them and put them in the right direction and to comfort them in knowing that God is speaking to them through that messenger. Many of you remember the account of Ahab and what went on in the wilderness of Tekoa with Jehoshaphat. Notice what it says here in 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. They were out there on the plain. And by the way, before I go into that, do you know that before this took place, um, Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of God that we can talk to before we go out into this battle? And so they brought in all these prophets and everyone was saying, oh, go ahead. God's with you. But the king of Judah said, isn't there any other prophets? These are all in agreement here. Isn't there any other? And you know what the king of Israel said? Oh, yeah, there's another one, but he never has anything good to say, so I don't want to bring him in. But they brought him in, and he said, don't go out, because you will die. So out there on that wilderness of Tekoa, it says, they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. So God sends these prophets to help strengthen, comfort, exhort, and to counsel, and to warn his people. And when we look in the Bible, we see that there are a lot of people who have been called to the prophetic office over the centuries. People that you know, many of them. The first one mentioned in the Bible is a man by the name of Enoch. Enoch, it says in the book of Jude, the seventh from Adam prophesied of the second coming of Jesus. Noah, for 120 years, prophesied that the world was going to be destroyed by a flood. And they mocked him and laughed at him, ridiculed him. Moses was called to the prophetic office as he was living up in the wilderness of the Midian desert. And God called him up and made him a prophet, one of the greatest prophets that had ever lived. And used him mightily for many, many years. Then we find a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah, if you remember, he was the one that never died. He went to heaven in a fiery chariot. Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet. He wrote the book of Isaiah. You know, it's very important to notice that these people that we've mentioned not, did not write any portion of the Bible except for Moses and, his, and Isaiah so far. These other prophets never wrote part of the Bible. You don't have to be a Bible writer to be a prophet, and we'll address that in a little bit. Besides Isaiah, after Isaiah, about 100 years later, we have a man by the name of Daniel, and we've studied a lot of what Daniel says in the book of Daniel. Jesus said the greatest prophet that ever lived was a man by the name of John the Baptist. But John the Baptist never wrote a book of the Bible. John himself, who wrote the book of John, not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John, wrote the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. And a man by the name of Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. But then we have other prophets such as Agabus. Notice what it says about Agabus. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. 
Not a very well-known prophet, but he was a prophet as is mentioned in the book of Acts. Another person that we oftentimes don't think of as holding the prophetic office was a person called Miriam. Miriam was the sister of Moses. And it tells us in Exodus that Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Did you notice that? She wasn't a man. She was a woman. There were several women that held the prophetic office in the Bible. Again, Judges chapter 4. Deborah was not only a judge in Israel, but look, now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. So you don't have to be a man to be called to the prophetic office. Another lady that is a, a, a little better known, and her name was uh, here listed in Second Chronicles. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tokath, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. So do you see, men and women both served in the prophetic office. A woman by the name of Anna, notice this. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was a, of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. That's one old woman. She'd been a widow for 84 years. And if she got married at 15 or 16, look how old that lady was. She's pushing 100. She was probably over 100. Besides these people, one man in the um, Bible, one of the first deacons of the church, was a man named Philip. Now, I raised three daughters. Philip raised four daughters. But all four of them had the prophetic gift. Notice what it tells us here in the book of Acts. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, that is the seven deacons, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who what? Who prophesied. So over and over we see these accounts of the prophetic gift in the scripture. And so there are three tremendous misconceptions today concerning the prophetic gift. The first is that a prophet must be a Bible writer. And if you think that a prophet must be a Bible writer, uh, go to the book of Elijah and tell me what you find. Elijah didn't write any of the Bible. You see, Noah didn't write any of the Bible. John the Baptist didn't write any of the Bible. Huldah didn't write any. Anna didn't. Deborah didn't. None of these people wrote any of the Bible. So you don't have to be a Bible writer to have the prophetic gift. The second misconception is that this gift was given only to men. But the Bible is very clear. Women were given this prophetic gift as well. And the third misconception is that the gift of prophecy ended with the death of the Apostle John. So there was to be no prophecy after the last of the Apostles died. There's no biblical proof for that. As a matter of fact, the Bible shows something totally different. Okay? So God has given gifts of the Holy Spirit to the church today. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be what? You see, there was a lot of ignorance 
Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant and concerning this very important gift that's given to us from God. And then in that chapter, he begins to enumerate on those from verses 7 and onward. He says, the manifest manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or everyone. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy. Do you see, all of these are there, including prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers or different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So the gifts of the spirit are still there. We do have a corruption of a lot of those gifts today. And we'll be studying that in just a, a few nights from now. So in that list, we see that some of the gifts of the Spirit are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul puts it this way. Speaking of God, it said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church. For the edification of the church till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you see, people today say, oh yeah, there's still pastors, and, and you know, there's evangelists, and there's teachers, but there's no prophets. How can they just pull one out of that list and say, all of them are there, but this one? It says in this passage that he put that in the church for the edifying, or the building up of the church, until Jesus comes back. And that we all become like him. And we receive a body like unto his glorious body. In the Old Testament, in the book of Joel, he even addresses the issues that were to come down to us in the last days. Joel chapter 2 says, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So he says his spirit is going to be poured out even upon young women here. Now watch what he goes on and says. Gives you an idea of the time setting when this was to happen. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So we have a sign here, and we'll look at it in a moment. The sign was that the sun would become like uh, the dark and the moon would become as blood. Then he says, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, and the Lord has said, and in what? The remnant whom the Lord shall call. We studied the other evening that that remnant that God called up was to take place after the beast received its deadly wound. In that period of time, prior to the end of the 2300-year prophecy that we've studied. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, it's talking about that event. It said, The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And if you remember from this, that that morning, about 9, 10 o'clock, depending upon where you were in the country, it began to get dark. And the birds began to go to roost. The cows began to go back to the barns and everything. 
And it got so dark that people had to light lanterns in the daytime just to see. That night, when the moon was supposed to come up, the moon came and it was blood red. And it gave absolutely no light. You can read the historical accounts, and it's been in some of these books and handouts I've given to you, that it says there eyewitnesses account that a piece of white paper held before the eyes was equally as black as the blackest velvet. New York Journal of Science says there's no explanation for it. Some people tried to make up stories. They always do. And they said, oh, well, it was because of some some grass fires, some prairie fires out on the prairie, and the smoke was kind of blocking the sun out. My friends, I've worked in covering news for forest fires before, and I'll tell you, if the smoke ever gets so thick you can't see the sun, you're dead. You're dead. To try and say that fires blocked out the moon and then made the blood red moon is ridiculous, and scientists totally reject that. When did this happen? If you remember, it happened on November 13th, 1833, just before the end of the 2300-year prophecy. And if some of you did not get the material on the sun and the moon and the stars, all of those signs, see me afterwards and I'll get that for you. So the book of Revelation is a very important book because that book reveals the very characteristics of the remnant church. And when we studied this the other night, we saw 20 points. And two of those 20 points, it said the dragon, that was who? Satan. Satan was wroth with who's the woman? The church. And he went to make war with the remnant or the last part of her seed. And then he identifies them with two points which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So two distinguishing characteristics here. One, this church lovingly obeys all of God's commandments, not just part of them. And second, it has the testimony of Jesus. And we went to that the other evening in Revelation 19.10 to see what that was, that testimony of Jesus and John said he saw an angel there, and he fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Now here it is. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So the last day church would have the prophetic gift in it, as well as keeping all of the commandments. Several Bible facts I want you to notice here tonight. The first one is that the gift of prophecy is to be found in the church as needed until Jesus comes back. Second important fact, it is included in all of the lists of the Spirit found throughout the New Testament. The third fact is that it is one of the identifying marks of God's true last day church. So the last day church must have that prophetic gift and must keep all of those commandments. For one to believe the Bible, they must of necessity, my friends, believe what the Bible teaches on this subject. They can't reject it because, oh, it don't sound right to me. If the Bible says it, it is right. So to reject what the Bible says will exist is to actually reject the Bible itself and God, the author of the scriptures. You cannot reject what says in there. As we looked at those 20 points several nights ago, we saw something very, very important. And that is that all 20 points must be met, including the spirit of prophecy. But somebody mentioned to me the other night, well, well, I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. You see, after that great disappointment in 1844 with the beginning of the judgment, we saw that God was to raise up a prophet among his people. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe that that gift 
was exhibited in the life and ministry of a woman at that time named Ellen Gould. Ellen was 16 years old when she had her first vision. You see, after that disappointment of October 1844, Ellen Harmon, or Ellen Harmon, yeah, her parents were Gould, Ellen Harmon had this vision. And in the vision, she saw the people of God on a pathway ascending to heaven. And she was looking and she saw all of these people going upward. But she could not see the people of God. The remnant that had gone through the Advent disappointment. And so the angel said, look a little higher. And she looked up and there way at the top were these Advent believers. And right in front of them was Jesus. And they were headed for the new Jerusalem. And she said, as some traveled along, they got weary, and they looked back, and they fell off of the path and back into the darkness of the world. And this vision was given to comfort and to encourage those disappointed people at that time. Ellen White, when she married James White, never once said her writings were above the Bible. As a matter of fact, she said her writings were a lesser light to lead to the greater light. She said if the people had studied their Bible as they should have, that they would never have needed her writings. But they did not, and so God raised it up. And yet people out there today say, oh, well, Seventh-day Adventists get all of their teachings from Ellen White. Now, this is night number 18, is it not? So 18 meetings, and how many times have I shared with you things from Ellen White? You see, everything we study comes from the Bible, not from Ellen White. No matter what people out there say, those people that say that have probably never been in one of our churches and know not what they speak of. Our teachings come from the Word of God. Now, James White, the husband of the prophetess, remember we saw back there that, that Huldah had a husband. You know, I don't know if I'd been too happy if I'd been married to a prophetess. <laughs> they have some insights on things going on. I just don't know how that would work out real good. But they had husbands. Now, watch what the husband of the prophetess said. He said, the Bible is perfect and complete. It is our only rule of faith and practice. That is the husband of the one with the prophetic gift. Notice again what the prophetess herself had to say. God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This is the work of God, or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. My work bears the stamp of God, or what? The stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in this matter. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God, or of the devil. You see this. So how do we know which is which? You see, only the only way you will ever know is to look what her writings say. Somebody mentioned to me the other night that somebody told them that, you know, that you have to believe in Ellen White as a prophetess to become a member of the church. That's not true. Why? Because how can you believe in her unless you've wrote, read what she wrote? You cannot accept her as a prophet of God because I do. You must do so because you have been convinced by the Spirit of God that that is one of his messengers. So you must study for yourselves. Here's what Ellen White said to the church as they were gathered together. I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. 
God has in that word promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from the Bi from Bible truth. The Lord designs to warn you, to reprove, to counsel through the testimonies given, and to impress your minds with the importance of his word. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already given. Does that sound like a person who's given us a whole new set of teachings? No. Our teachings come from the scripture. And she said, that's where they have to come from. Her husband said, that's where they have to come from. You see, Ellen White had a very interesting experience when she was carried into vision. And I'm going to share a few of those visions with you. But one of those visions in particular, she was in vision for one and a half hours. And during that one and a half hours, she held this Bible right here up over her head. That Bible weighs 18 and a half pounds. It is 18 inches by 11 inches by 4 inches thick. Now you can just take one of those pew Bibles in the pew and try to hold it up there till I get done preaching. I'll tell you what, your arm will give out on you. Now, when she did this, she weighed about 96, 97 pounds and held an 18 and a half pound Bible up like that for an hour and a half. In some of those visions, they had physicians that were present. In one of them, the physician came up to examine her. And he held a candle in front of her mouth, and the flame did not flicker as she spoke. He put a mirror in front of her, and there was no moisture that formed on the mirror. And the physician turned and fled out of the building in fear and said, Let me out of here. She breathes not. Do you know that that's what the word inspiration means, is God breathed? Remember in Daniel, he fell on his face, and there remained no more breath in him. So God worked through them this way, and I'll share some of these as we go through here. But I want to share with you what one of the early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers had to say about this gift. He said, on the supposition now that these, speaking of her writings, are not the work of the Spirit of God, as they must then be the work of who? The devil. It's got to be one or the other. We inquire, has the devil thus fallen in love with truth and righteousness? Has he made a league with the word of God to sustain and to uphold it? Has he so far lost sight of the interests of his own kingdom as to lend his efforts to root out all false doctrines from our belief and all seeds of unrighteousness from our hearts that we may have the truth without error? and live a life without sin? In view of these considerations, what shall we conclude? Those who reject these manifestations do so not only without evidence, but against all evidence. Those who profess to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone are bound to receive what the Bible tells them will exist and commands them to respect. You see, this is important to understand. This is what God did in working through the prophetic gift to strengthen this church. Remember, Seventh-day Adventists are comprised of people from every denomination that you can think of, including those that were heathen like me, from no church. God had all of those people, and he pulled them all together. He still does it today. And they studied together and laid aside all of these preconceived ideas and decided to go simply with what the Bible teaches. And if it was truth, they retained it. If it was false, they rejected it. And Ellen White, in volume one of Selected Messages, said this. The Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. 
the sole bond of union, all who bow to this holy word will be in harmony. Let us meet all opposition as did our master saying, it is written. Let us lift up the banner which is inscribed the Bible, our rule of faith and discipline. Do you see this? The Bible is what brings us together. We must know what the Word of God teaches, and we must stand by what the Word of God teaches. When Ellen White was quite young, before she was married to James White, she went out to the home of a man named Otis Nickel out on the East Coast in Massachusetts. Everybody out there, remember, we had come out of this great disappointment, and there were all kinds of fanatical things going on. And God sent this now 17-year-old girl out to address the problems in these churches. And there was a group there in Massachusetts, two guys in particular, Sergeant and Robbins, and they headed up one of the fanatical offshoot groups and said, if Ellen Harmon ever came into their presence, she would be unable to have a vision and that they would prove that she was a false prophet. So Ellen White was sent by God out there to address these issues. Well, in those days, they did not have a Motel 6 or a Ramada Inn. They stayed in people's homes. And so she stayed in the home of Otis Nichol. That night, as they were preparing for bed, young Ellen had gone already up to her room to retire. And there was a knock on the door. And Brother Nichols opened the door, and there stood, of all people, Sergeant and Robbins. And they came in, and they started taking their coats and hats off. They were going to stay the night there, too. You didn't travel at night. They didn't have headlights, either. And so they were going to spend the night. And Otis Nichols said, Oh, brethren, I am so glad you are here. Sister Harmon is here, and she's up in the room. But perhaps tomorrow we can get all of this settled. These guys snatched back their coats and their hats. And they said, oh, we're sorry, brother. We can't stay. We were just passing through. One to stop and say hi. We'll see you later. Nichols said, oh, come on, brethren. Stay so we can get this worked out. Said, we can't do that. But I'll tell you what. If you bring her to South Boston tomorrow, then we will prove her to be a false prophet. Well, they left. The next morning, they're getting ready to go to church. Otis Nichols thinks they're going to South Boston. Ellen Harmon said, no, brother, we're going to Randolph, almost 20 miles in the other direction. And, she, and Nichols said, but Sister Ellen, if we do, they'll say that you're trying to avoid them and, and, and we won't be able to minister. And she says, brother, the Lord says we are to go to Randolph, and to Randolph we shall go. So they went to Randolph to the great disillusionment of Otis Nickel, and when they walked in the front door of the church in Randolph, guess who was there? Sergeant and Robbins. And there's where she went into a vision and held the Bible up for a long, long time in that one. They would even, as she was flipping through pages, they'd stand on chairs because she would point, and they wondered, is she really pointing at what she's quoting or reading? And they'd stand on chairs and look in that Bible, and every time she'd flip the pages above her head and put her finger there, it was always on the verse she was referring to. N um, Sergeant Robbins they began to sing while she was talking and in this vision and quoting scriptures. Tried to sing real loud, some of their followers with them, to drown her out so people couldn't hear her. But her voice was so loud that they couldn't drown it out. Everybody heard every word. And when she came out of that vision, Sergeant and Robbins had had the rug yanked out from under them. They'd lost all of their fanatical positions and the people of God were united in that 
in that part of the country. So those are the things that go on. You know, many things are said about Ellen White. Some are good and some are bad. But I could show you books that I've got in my library at home where some people say bad things about the Bible. Some people say bad things about Jesus. Some people say bad things about all Christians. You can't go by what other people say. You must investigate for yourself. Notice again what the Word of God teaches us here. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will what? I will require it of him. You see, when God speaks to us through one of his messengers, it will be required of us if we reject that message. I want to share one other little interesting thing with you here. Ellen White is an older woman now. She is traveling around in the 1890s. She's on the East Coast. It's November. It's cold. It's November 3rd, 1890. And she's in Salamanca, New York. And she had a vision one night. And the next morning, she went to share that vision with her son, Willie, who traveled with her. And she started out, and she says, Willie, the Lord gave me a vision last night. And then this vision, I saw these men go into a large upper room, and that was it. And she just kind of lost it all. And Willie said, Mother, what is it? And she says, I don't know, Willie. The thing is gone from me. She could not remember the vision. This happened again. Same thing. She starts telling it, gets a little ways into it, and forgot it. It happened five times. Eventually, from New York, they end up in Battle Creek, Michigan, to the general conference session of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There she was having the early morning meeting every morning, about 5.30. That's early morning. You know, I was doing meetings out in California once, and they had me doing early morning meetings at 6 o'clock in the morning. My first meeting with those folk, I said, you know, I've learned something since I've been here with you. 6 o'clock comes two times in a day. I've never experienced this one before. You see, 5.30 in the morning. And so... After a few days, the general conference president asked Ellen White, said, Sister White, will you be having our morning devotional tomorrow? And she said, no, brother, I'm tired. She basically said, I'm going to sleep in for a little while. So that night, there was a meeting of some of our leading brethren in the church. These men went up into an upper room over the Review and Herald. One of them took a key and locked the door and held up the key and said, we will not leave here till this is settled, and he stuck it in his vest pocket. They sat around that table until almost daybreak, about four-something in the morning, and they wanted to get the word Sabbath out of our publications because people found it offensive. It's happening again today, my friends. And they, one of the men lifted up one of our magazines, said very unsavory things about it, and threw it down on the table with much disrespect. Well, because it was getting close to the time for people to get up to go to that early morning meeting, they had to discontinue their meeting. As Willie got up that morning and he was headed to the early morning meeting, he looked up and he saw the light on in his mother's room. And so he went up to see what was going on because he had thought she was going to sleep later. As he went up there and went into the room, his mother was just putting her shawl around her shoulders and grabbed her Bible and was headed out the door. And Willie says, Mother, where are you going? 
And she said, Willie, the Lord gave me that vision again last night, and I am to share it today. And she went on out the door with Willie trotting right fast behind her. He'd missed it five times. He wanted to find out what this was. They got into the building. General Conference president was just getting up from the opening prayer, and he looked back, and he saw her coming down the aisle. And he could tell by the look on her face that there was something important going on. And he said, Sister White, has the Lord given you a message for us today? And she said, indeed he has, brother. And she went straight up and took the pulpit and began to address the congregation, stating that the Lord showed her in a vision how some men had gone into an upper room above a building and that one of the men had taken a key and locked the door and said they weren't leaving until it was, uh, the matter was settled. She said, I was shown that it was not the Spirit of God that was in control, but a spirit from beneath. And how one brother took up a magazine of ours and said unkind and unchristian things about it and with disdain threw it down. And as she's sharing that, all of a sudden, the guy right up front, a couple of rows back, jumped up, tears streaming down his face. He said, may God forgive me. I was the man that locked that door last night. Ellen White said, last night? You see, she thought it had happened a few months before. And another one jumped up. And weeping said, I was the one who handled that magazine disrespectfully. And one after another, those guys began to weep and confess their sins. And God worked a reformation and strengthened the church by it. That was how God worked with his people there. You'll see... Our only safety, my friends, is in accepting what God sends to us. Anyone that makes a claim that they have the prophetic gift need to be investigated. If they do not have the gift, if we see they're not in harmony, we reject them. If they are in harmony with Scripture, we accept them. To reject one who meets all of the biblical criteria is to reject the God who sent that messenger. i got to share one more before we have prayer. There was a woman in our church by the name of Anna Phillips. Our headquarters were in Battle Creek, Michigan, and our pastor of the biggest church that we had in Battle Creek was a man by the name of A.T. Jones. And one Sabbath morning, A.T. Jones got up and began to read stuff from Ellen White and another thing from Anna Rice Phillips. And he would say, see, brethren, it is the same spirit. And then he'd read from here and read from there. You see, it is the same spirit. That was what his whole sermon was about on that Sabbath. The church was confused and puzzled as to what was going on. Well, the next day, one of the great things of living in a town where it's mostly Seventh-day Adventists, post offices are closed on the Sabbath, but they were open on Sunday. And so Sunday morning, A.T. Jones went to the post office to see if he had any mail postman handed him a letter from Ellen White, who was in Australia at this time. He went over and he sat down on a bench in the post office, opened his letter and began to read. And as he read, he began to weep. He was weeping so hard that his whole body was shaking. And another minister, Oscar Tate, came in and saw Pastor Jones weeping. And he went over and he put his hand on his shoulder and said, Brother Alonso, what is wrong? And A.T. Jones handed him up the letter and said, read for yourself. 
And as he read the letter from Ellen White, it says, How dare you, my brother, to stand before the people of God and present the writings of Sister Phillips as if they were of the same spirit that God had used me for. You have brought shame and reproach upon the church, confusion to your brothers and sisters, and that the spirit in Anna Phillips is not the spirit of God, but she is being deceived by Satan. And you have added to this. And she rebuked him strongly. And as he read it, he looked over, or as he finished, as Tate finished reading it, A.T. Jones looked at him and said, Oh, Brother Oscar, how could Ellen White know a month ago what I only did yesterday? She was in Australia, remember. The postmark was a month prior to that, and he hadn't even done it, but it came the day after he did it. Oscar Tate says, oh, Brother Alonzo, you know, you know. He went back the following week. He apologized to the church. Ellen White had also put a message in there for Anna Phillips, and she realized that she'd been deceived and went on to become a mighty Bible worker for God. This is how God used the spirit of prophecy in the church. This is why we're told, do not quench the spirit. Do not what? Do not quench it, do not despise prophecy, but test all things and hold fast that which is good. I want to share with you the words of Jesus as we pull it together. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor the world to come. Do you see this? If God speaks and you reject what the Spirit of God says, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. When we look at Ellen White, she was born in 1827 and lived till 1915. And she was called by God to the prophetic office in 1844 at 16 years old. And as such, she was a faithful servant and messenger of God for over 70 years in this church. And so again, I leave you with the words of Scripture. Believe in the Lord your God so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. Let us pray. Father, we do want to thank you so very, very much for the clarity of your word and, and for the many blessings that you've poured out upon your last day people. Help us, Father, to truly search under the guidance of your spirit and to know what is truth and what you have sent to us, that we might be able to avoid all the darkness, deception, the cunningly devised fables and doctrines of devils that are so prevalent today, Father. As we separate tonight, watch over us, keep us safe, and bring us together tomorrow that we can continue our studies of your word is our prayer in your son's dear name. Amen. Again, don't forget to pick up your uh, book out there as well as the handout tonight.